Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Fume Hoods, going behind the scenes with the industry's latest technology. It's presented by Beth Menkemeyer, the sales engineer for chemical fume hoods at Lab Conco. We are excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Lab Conco. Serving the scientific community since 1925, Lab Conco manufactures laboratory equipment specializing in ventilation products such as chemical fume hoods and biological safety cabinets. Other product lines include glassware washers and freeze dryers. Lab Conco has ISO 9001 certification, one measure of the company's commitment to quality and consistency in design and manufacturing. Lab Conco equipment is manufactured in Kansas City, Missouri and Fort Scott, Kansas and marketed worldwide to academic, industrial, life science, pharmaceutical, environmental, forensic, and clinical laboratories. To learn more about Lab Conco, please visit www.labconco.com. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone this event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice you'll be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. Finally, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know you're having a problem. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Beth Menkemeyer. Beth has presented multiple times at the American Industrial Hygiene Conference and Exposition and at PitCon. Before joining Lab Conco in 2013, Beth was a business development manager at Ruskin Company, where she focused on the manufacturing of louvers for the HVAC industry and architectural products. She holds degrees from the University of Kansas and University of St. Mary. Beth is a construction documents technologist certified by the Construction Specifications Institute and a lead green associate. Please join me in welcoming Beth Menkemeyer. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you, Judy. Hello, everybody. I want to thank you for joining my webinar today on fume hoods. My name is Beth Menkemeyer from Lab Conco, and if you have any questions while I'm doing this webinar, please be sure to send those in so I can answer them. So without further ado, well, let's get started. Here is our agenda for this webinar. First, we are going to review some basic laboratory ventilation, and then we're going to talk about where fume hoods started and how the designs made their way to what they are today. Then we're going to talk specifically about high performance fume hoods, their definition, and what makes them different. And we're even going to compare two different high performance fume hoods against each other to show that not every high performance fume hood is made equal. Then I have an example showing how large of a return on investment can occur just for switching to a high performance fume hood. And then we're going to switch gears and discuss ductless hoods and the different types that are offered in today's market. And finally, we will compare ducted fume hoods to ductless fume hoods to see what might might make sense for your lab if you're in the market. Here are the items that we're going to discuss as far as basic laboratory ventilation, just to make sure everyone understands generally how a fume hood works so you can differentiate it from other enclosures and maybe even understand your lab a little bit better. So you may not know it, but the room that you're in has been engineered to have a certain amount of air enter the room and a certain amount of air leave the room. This is true if you're at home, in a lab, or at a shopping mall. The air entering the room is called the supply air, and the air exiting the room is called the exhaust air. It must be balanced to maintain even pressure in the room. Rooms can be slightly negative or slightly positive for different reasons, However, if one is off significantly, you will be able to tell. For example, let's say it's summertime 
and you turn your fume hood blower on, and it suddenly becomes very warm in the room. This means the room is too negative. It's warm because all of the air-conditioned air is being exhausted from the lab. This means there is not enough makeup air being supplied to the room. So, like most things, it's about finding balance. So before I get into all of the fume hood talk, I want to make sure we all know that when more air is exhausted from the room than supplied to it, it's negatively pressured. And conversely, when more air is supplied to the room than exhausted, it's positively pressured. These basic rules give you the building blocks for what we need to know for the rest of the presentation. So now we're getting into fume hood specific ventilation and how air moves through a fume hood. The room air is going to be pulled through the hood via the blower and exhausted outside. We measure the air that is exhausted in a few different ways. First, there is the volumetric flow of air. Basically, we're going to take an amount of air and pull it through the fume hood opening and vent it outside. The volumetric flow is typically measured in cubic feet per minute, or CFM for short. You'll hear CFM a lot in this presentation and whenever you talk about HVAC or air movement. It's saying that we are taking a cubic foot and filling it with air and seeing how many of those move in a minute. So this is how we measure the exhaust requirements of a fume hood and the makeup air requirements for the room. The other measurement we look at is the speed of the air going through the front of the fume hood. We call that the face velocity. Depending on how much air, or CFM, you're putting through that front opening, that will determine the face velocity. I like to compare this to water because it's relatable and you can see water. And since air and water are both fluids, they are comparable. So think of watering flowers in the garden with a garden hose and picture some flowers being just out of reach of the water coming out of the hose. So what can you do to make the water reach the back flowers? You can put your thumb over the end, blocking off a portion of the hose opening. The water sprays further because the speed of the water increases. It's not increasing the amount of water, it's just the same amount of water going through a smaller opening. And also, within that same relationship, if you increase the amount of water with the same opening on the hose, the velocity will increase. Same thing with the fume hood. And more, the more air you put through the fume hood, the faster the air will go through the sash, which is the glass window on the hood that travels up and down. We can measure the face velocity of a fume hood or the speed of the air entering the plane of the sash with certain types of equipment. The anemometer measures the speed of the air entering the space in feet per minute, or SPM for short. You'll see most of today's fume hoods published with an operating range of 60 to 100 feet per minute. Sometimes they cannot be operated as low as 60 feet per minute, and we'll get into that later during the high performance HUD discussion. But for now, just pay attention to manufacturers' published data to see what range is acceptable. So now we know what the important air measurements are on a fume hood, but there are different types of mechanical systems we can put the hood on. So we're going to take a quick look at those now. The two mechanical system designs we will talk about today are constant air volume and variable air volume. We will also discuss the application specific reasons for going with a certain mechanical system. You may hear constant air volume and variable air volume referred to as CAV and VAV, respectively. These refer to the volumetric flow, or the CFM, that we just discussed. The constant volume system has the same amount of air exhausting through the hood regardless of your sash position. So going back to the garden hose example, the face velocity, or the speed of the air, is going to increase as you close the sash since you're putting the same amount of air through a smaller opening. The hood has bypass areas to assist so the air doesn't go too fast. However, it's still going through the path of least resistance and will mostly enter through the sash opening unless the sash is completely closed. These types of setups are best for smaller labs in, or limited use or specialty application hoods where hoods need to be on a dedicated blower. 
The other type of mechanical system that I'll be discussing a little bit more in depth um, is the variable air volume system, or VAV, which means that the amount of air varies depending on the sash position. The reason for these systems is to save energy, and it's to save energy while the hood is not in use. Many hoods are used all day, every day around the world. And since fume hoods are such heavy energy users, a lot of owners want to minimize the amount of air they exhaust to ultimately save on their building's energy costs. This type of system is set up with supply and exhaust controls so that you get maximum energy savings out of the whole system by varying the volumetric flow based upon the sash position. And it uses a valve or a damper in the duct. These systems are best for large labs, like general chemistry labs, where the fume hoods are running all the time. These systems usually feature a lot of automation. There are sensors that can be placed on fume hoods so that when it doesn't sense movement in front of the hood, the sash will close, and then automatically lower the volumetric flow and result in savings when the hood isn't in use. So these will have a larger upstart cost but when they're used appropriately, they will save significant money in the long run. Both of these systems can be used to help with air changes in the laboratory. This is also a good time to add that regardless of the mechanical system or fume hood type, the hood will only be effective if the lab is well balanced and the hood is placed away from cross drafts. This image is showing that if there is a hood placed in front of a supply air register, you'll want to block off the section that faces the fume hood to eliminate the strong cross drafts coming from that location. The bottom line here is that the less cross drafts you have, the better the hood will perform since the air entering the hood won't have to combat other air vectors that are in front of the hood. So here shows a typical setup for a ducted fume hood that we have straight duct work that's coming off the top of the hood into a 90 degree elbow to go into, and then some other straight duct, and then it goes into the inlet of the blower. And it terminates in a vertical up direction. And it's very important that it terminates this way in order to meet the ANSI Z9.5 standard. So if there are any goosenecks or caps on the end, those need to be replaced with a zero pressure weather cap or some other type of stack that allows the air to flow vertically without taking weather in. The blower is what makes the fume hood work. It is what is pulling the air away from the user and directing it outside. The hood just makes the air enter as efficiently as possible. So if you're finding something wrong with the flow, troubleshooting can mean looking at the entire duct run. Blowers also must be sized for their duct run to overcome the resistance of traveling through all of the duct. In order to do that, we look at how much air we are putting through the specific duct run design. So we look at things like the duct diameter and the length, the straight length, and the number of elbows to see how much resistance is in that system, which is the static pressure. The remote blower configuration is the most typical for all fume hood setups. The blower is mounted remotely, usually on a rooftop outside, and it keeps all the ductwork under negative pressure. This means if there's a leak in your ductwork, it will just keep sucking air in through the leak. So it is a fail-safe. For the best blower efficiency, efficient, efficiency, keep some straight duct lengths in between transitions. It is not a good idea to put an elbow right on top of a fume hood duct collar. The reason being, it will pull air faster on one side of the fume hood, and you'll lose blower efficiency. And you'll need to size up on your blower in order to pull the right CFM. So a lot of times, you will need to challenge your blower with a damper. I compare this to making a smoothie. So when you have a lot of ice in your blender, and then some of the ice doesn't, get, doesn't quite fall down to the blades, then you notice the blades spin very fast, and you can sometimes even smell the motor burning up. It's the same concept with a fume hood blower. These motors like to have some resistance in order to function in their prime fan curve. The damper helps to add resistance to that duct run. The built-in blower configuration is a simpler configuration where the blower is installed right on top of the fume hood 
and it's actually pushing the air out. These are good for short duct runs that don't travel through occupied spaces. So something like a mobile lab would be appropriate for this. The reason being, if a leak develops in the built-in blower configuration, the duct is under I'm sorry, the duct is under positive pressure, and it will push the contaminated air out of the leak location. So if your duct is traveling through an office building with multiple floors and you are working with a hazardous chemical, then it will leak into the other occupant's space if a leak developed in that duct run. And so they're, they're going to be breathing in whatever you're working with. So it's always better to go with a remote blower, and only if you cannot make that work should you go with a built-in blower. ASHRAE 110 is the American test standard developed for fume hoods. And it's a three-part test that consists of measuring the face velocity profile, the smoke visualization test, and a tracer gas test with a mannequin placed in front of the fume hood to mimic a person and their breathing zone. It can be rated as, as manufactured, meaning the hood was tested off the assembly line, as installed, meaning the hood is newly installed in the lab, or as used, meaning the hood is installed and the operational equipment and implements are in the hood as it's being tested. So this is really just a test standard and it doesn't state anything about passing or failing. And this test can be done on any fume hood type. And I'm going to reference this test later when we talk about high performance fume hoods. So in the next three slides, I'm going to show three different fume hood types to further show how they're different from each other. So the first is the typical bypass hood. This is a typical hood that goes on a constant air volume system. And this hood has bypass areas for the air to enter as you shut the sash. So hence the name bypass hood. So this image is showing the sash open on the left and the sash closed on the right to show where the room air enters the fume hood when the sash is open and shut. And you can see that it's entering through the upper bypass behind the sash and through the airfoil opening at the work surface when the sash is shut. And over the years, hoods have evolved really due to energy costs. Um, so in the 1970s, the auxiliary air hood was invented. The concept is that instead of just exhausting all the air from the room, since you're paying so much money to condition that air, why not just force air directly from the outside into the hood and only require about half the air from the air conditioned room? So on paper, this is a fantastic idea since it saves half your energy. Um, but in practice, however, with the sash open, when the user is standing right in front of the fume hood, it actually pours all the outside air directly on the user, creating a potentially uncomfortable working condition, like thinking of in the middle of summer down in Texas. Um, it also creates a cross draft of air right in front of the sash. With the sash closed, it does its job and pours the outside air directly into the fume hood interior. These types of hoods are actually not recommended anymore and they're not even produced by many manufacturers. In fact, prudent practices in the, in the laboratory handling and management of chemical hazards states, auxiliary air hoods should not be purchased for new installations, and existing auxiliary air hoods should be replaced or modified to eliminate the supply air feature of the hood. So in today's hood world, there really shouldn't be a need for these since most new hoods have high performance technology that can use less air without the need for the auxiliary air source. Then in the 1980s, the VAV concept came into play. The left image shows the sash fully open and the right image shows the sash fully closed. VAV hoods can change the exhaust volume using different methods one being a damper or valve in the exhaust duct that opens and closes based on a sash position, which is shown in this image in the ductwork above the fume hood. Or they may have a blower that changes speeds to meet air volume demands. VAV hoods will require a restricted bypass, which sometimes is referred to as a bypass block, uh, and that is there to create a path of resistance and ensure adequate phase velocity at any sash position. 
So then came the 2000s, where the first high performance fume hoods were developed. You may also hear these types of hoods called low flow or high efficiency or low velocity. They are all acceptable for use on a constant air volume or a VAV system. And they can be operated down to 60 feet per minute face velocity in a laboratory setting. There are only so many hoods that can call themselves a high performance fume hood. So I'll explain how they are tested and how they earn that title. Going back to the ASHRAE 110 containment test, the test can be performed at different face velocities. And sometimes they are challenged at a very low level. So the lowest operating airflow that's allowed in a laboratory is 60 feet per minute, as stated in standards like OSHA, CIFA, and the Industrial Ventilation Manual of Recommended Practices. CIFA is the Scientific Equipment and Furniture Association. And they're an organization made of industry manufacturers and representatives who created the definition of a high performance fume hood. The definition states that the hood must pass the ASHRAE 110 containment test operating at 60 feet per minute face velocity with the sash fully open, which is defined as a minimum of 25 inches open, and on average, less than 0.05 parts per million of the tracer gas can be detected in an as-manufactured test. So that means it was tested by the manufacturer right off the assembly line in their test lab. If this test is done in the field as an as-installed or as-used test, it actually allows an average of 0.1 part per million of the tracer gas to be detected with the same fully open sash position and 60 feet per minute base velocity setup. So in the test lab, it allows 0.05 parts per million. And if it's as installed or as used, it allows 0.1 parts per million. So keep in mind, manufacturers that say their hoods are high performance should have the test reports to back that information up. CIFA itself states the following. Note, low flow hoods which achieve a reduction in volumetric flow by restricting the sash opening area do not qualify as low velocity or high performance fume hoods unless they also meet the performance requirements listed above through the maximum sash opening. The maximum sash opening shall be considered a vertical sash opening not less than 25 inches high off the fume hood work surface. That was a quote from CIFA that basically states that you may see a fume hood touted to operate at 60 feet per minute phase velocity, but that is not a high performance hood unless it was tested with the sash fully open and achieved an average of 0.05 parts per million or less in an as manufactured condition. So if the published data only shows 60 feet per minute, but the sash opening is 18 inches, that is not a high performance fume hood because the challenge comes from having the sash raised above the breeding zone. This doesn't mean the fume hood can't operate in the field with the sash at 18 inches, but in order to call itself a high performance fume hood, it needs to pass the test with the sash fully open. So now that we know what a high performance fume hood is, let's look at some reasons why it's better than a traditional fume hood. Here is a computational fluid dynamics image of the Lab Conco Extreme fume hood during an ASHRAE 110 test, which Lab Conco tests down to 40 feet per minute face velocity to give the user a large margin of error when they operate at 60 feet per minute. What you're seeing is the sulfur hexafluoride tracer gas plume and how it is taken directly back into the baffle. This is exactly what you want to see in this scenario, and we're going to go over the technology that helps it move this way. Here we have another CFD image, this time showing a traditional design. In this image, the red lines represent where the air is traveling, and you can see the large roll at the top. That is air vortexing and rolling behind the sash. It's okay if it stays there, but there's a risk of that contaminated air coming down into the breathing zone. Then on the high performance side, we have air entering the hood and traveling almost straight back to the baffle to be taken away out of the breathing zone. This is what we want to see to practically eliminate that roll that happens at the top of the hood. 
This way there's no risk of that contaminated air coming back and entering the breathing zone. Now we're going to talk about the patented design features that make LabConco high performance hoods work. This is to show you why a regular hood cannot perform like a high performance hood. These engineered features are the reason the air moves more efficiently through these hoods. The clean sweep technology refers to the sash handle and sash track opening where air can enter in a smooth fashion and bring contaminants back. When our hoods were redesigned in 2012, the sash handle was a very important place for improvement over what was currently being offered since the sash handle is the closest feature near your breathing zone. So since we have this rounded and slotted sash handle, it allows the air to move aerodynamically so that room air enters and corrects turbulence at that area. Here's an image showing the fluid dynamics of that sash handle. So the air glides into the hood in the desirable pattern, very smooth, taking contaminants contaminants away from the breathing zone. Here is a CFD image showing another extremely important area of the fume hood, the airfoil. The reason this area is so important is that vapors can actually linger on the work surface and we want to make sure those are taken away. So the airfoil is the component that directs the air across the work surface to the baffle. LabConco does have a unique airfoil, it's called an ecofoil, and it was developed after testing over 50 prototype, prototype models. The ecofoil is one of the components that makes these hoods high performance because it corrects turbulence so that when the air enters the hood, it's entering smoothly with more of the same direction. And if you have more air moving in the same direction, it will be more effective at taking contaminants in the desired direction, which in this case is away from the user and straight to the baffle. The baffle shown here is what's offered on, on our extreme fume hood. Um, it's the OptiZone system, and it's referring to the different slot hole sizes. So it actually creates a uniform face velocity profile, which if you remember in the ASHRAE 110 test, that's part of that test. So you want the air to be entering the hood at the same speed across the face. So you want it to be entering at the same speed in the middle, and you want it to be entering at the same speed at the sides. Um, and so this is actually what directs the air to do that. Here is the CFD image of the baffle on the extreme fume hood. And you can see it has a double baffle system, which is a feature that makes more of a suction at the baffle. So if vapors get close, the air is moving so fast that it will get taken away and not linger in the fume hood. So now I'm going to go over the numbers with you. I was tasked with persuading a design professional to specify LabConco hoods over a competitor who also offers a high performance hood. So we're seeing the high performance head to head. So this is going to show you that not all high performance hoods are alike, and you'll see how much money was saved by going with the LabConco hood. So this customer required a, uh, a set point of 100 feet per minute base velocity at a sash position 18 inches above the work surface. And for that velocity, for that uh, velocity requirement, the LabConco hood only requires 720 CFM, but the competitor's hood requires 830 CFM. So to be clear, both of these hoods will operate at 100 feet per minute face velocity with the sash open 18 inches above the work surface. But because of design differences, the LabConco hood requires less air. A lot of people misunderstand this concept, so I'm actually going to say it in a different way. If your facility requires 100 feet per minute when the sash is 18 inches open, you must look at the fume hood manufacturer's published CFM for reference. A lot of engineers will just calculate this based on the sash opening, and you simply cannot do that on a fume hood since there are too many variables when you're sizing blowers and, and all of that. 
Um, so what you're going to end up with if you do do that is a room that isn't properly balanced or significant oversizing of a system, which equals wasted money. So in this example, I looked up LabConco CFM requirements and our competitors, which we'll just call Hood B. And on this particular project, there were 45 hoods. So I took the difference between Hood B's CFM and LabConco's CFM and multiplied it by 45 hoods. And the difference is 4,950 CFM. So it almost accounts for 5,000 cubic feet per minute. So picture 5,000 cubes that are one foot by one foot by one foot. If an engineer were to size this system based upon a calculation instead of the manufacturer's published data, the system could be off by 5,000 CFM. So it's imperative to size based on the manufacturer's published data. We're going to keep this number in our back pocket to calculate annual energy costs, but first we're going to look at the startup costs since those impact your budget immediately. So this was a new building, so they were looking at sizing their supply air requirements. So we're going to look at how much money they saved in makeup air costs by going with the Lab Conco hood. We have the following constants here. With laboratories, you cannot recirculate air coming out of a fume hood exhaust, so it is all called first pass air. So it has to enter the lab and be exhausted, not recirculate like a residential or office building. So this brings the estimate in labs to about 200 CFM per ton of AC. And this is a conservative estimate because I've actually seen this number go down to about 130 CFM per ton. So just for reference, in your home, if someone's sizing a new air conditioning unit, they can use about 400 CFM per ton. So um, labs obviously have more of a demand. We can estimate that this unit will be about $1,800 per ton. And so we'll take the difference from the previous slide, which was 4,950, and we'll divide it by how many CFM per ton that was 200, and then so we get the requirement to be about 25 tons. And then we're going to take that times the $1,800, and we get $45,000 that was saved even before a hood is purchased. So that number alone will pay for five or six fume hoods. And I'm just showing you this to show if you're looking at fume hood prices, Sometimes the cheapest hood actually shakes out to be more expensive because it will require more air. So it needs to be looked at as a whole. So now we're actually going to calculate how much we save on the annual basis just operating the Lab Conco hood versus the competitor's hood. A good conservative estimate for energy costs is $7 per CFM per year. This would be higher on the East Coast, but it's a really good number for the middle of the road. So if we take that original difference of CFM times $7 per CFM per year, we get 34650 So this is how much we would save per year if the hoods operate 24-7 all the time. So let's say the hoods are on a VAB system and they're only operating half the year. We're still saving $17,325 every year. So that's not too bad. Then if we multiply that over the life of the hood, so say 10 years, we will get $173,250. And then we're going to add the startup costs in, and we saved $218,250 just by going with the Lab Conco high performance hood. And this isn't even mentioning that you're lowering your carbon footprint by how much because you're saving 5,000 CFM per year basically. So it's, you're using less energy overall. So this slide shows some good estimates for how much savings in percentage terms you can expect just from going from a constant volume hood to a high performance hood and then a VAV hood and then finally, kind of merging everything together and putting your high performance hood on a VAV system with a motion detector stash system. So it could equal over a 90% reduction in your CFM, which means saving a lot of money and lowering your carbon footprint again. So it's a win-win. 
So that wraps up our ducted conversation for the moment. And we're going to switch gears and talk about ductless hoods now. So just so everyone's on the same page, ductless enclosures are self-contained workstations that use carbon filters to protect the operator from harmful vapors. They obviously require no duct, and the contaminated air circulates through carbon filtration and flows back into the room, and it's cleansed of the chemical vapors. So these are ideal for your temporary or leased spaces or areas where you wouldn't be able to duct out, like a basement, or in the case of this photo, at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, where the lab is actually directly under this dinosaur. <laughs> Duct work wouldn't look too nice going through that dinosaur, would it? So um, I will go over the applications that are not appropriate for this type of enclosure and also discuss the definitions of the three different types of ductless hoods in the slides ahead. The same organization that created the definition for a high performance fume hood also created the ductless hood definitions. That organization, once again, is CIFA, the Scientific Equipment and Furniture Association. So the DH1 is defined as a ductless hood equipped with a filtration device designed to control non-toxic chemicals, nuisance odors, particulates. So this enclosure is just for nuisance vapors or non-hazardous chemistry. These are going to typically have application-specific carbon filters to cover chemical families like acid sulfur, formaldehyde, or ammonia. These enclosures also typically don't come with a sensor, so changing the filter depends on odor breakthrough unless you use some kind of a secondary sensor. At LabConco, we call this enclosure a fume adsorber or a protector workstation. The DH2 is defined as a ductless hood capable of meeting all DH1 requirements and equipped with a filtration device designed to filter manufacturer-approved toxic contaminants up to filter breakthrough only. A DH2 ductless hood is not designed to provide secondary containment beyond primary filter breakthrough. So it must meet all the requirements of a DH1 and also be able to filter hazardous chemistry and have a sensor. These enclosures also have application-specific carbon filters to cover the chemical families. And the sensor is located on, on, on the top of the filter stack on this type of enclosure. So once the filter breakthrough has been sensed, the application should stop and the filters need to be changed. And at LabConco, we call this enclosure a paramount. The DH3 is the final definition. It is a ductless hood capable of meeting all DH2 requirements and equipped with a filtration device designed to filter manufacturer-approved toxic contaminants beyond primary filter breakthrough by providing secondary backup protection. Once the primary filter breakthrough point has been detected, a DH3 ductless hood should be designed to provide a period of time to continue and end an ongoing experiment with its secondary backup filter system. The secondary filter must be of the same type of media and efficacy as the primary filter. So, these hoods typically have one universal carbon type that can actually filter out acid, bases, and solvents. And at LabConco, the DH3 products are called the Protector Echo and Protector Arrow, or the Echo and the Arrow. Those hoods are actually a marriage of products between LabConco and a company called Erlab using their green fume hood technology. So we refer to this as a filtered fume hood to differentiate it from other ductless hoods because when we get phone calls that just say, I need a ductless hood, you can see that there's a really large range to narrow it down from. So since the Echo and the Arrow can do so much more than the DH1 and the DH2 and even the minimum requirements of the DH3, it's an easy way to differentiate it when you are talking in the world of ductless and filtered fume hoods. This slide elaborates on the way the filtered fume hood is differentiated from the DH1 and the DH2. So the DH3, the filtered fume hood, they are the closest thing to a general chemistry fume hood without being ducted out. So since they have that comprehensive filter, they can filter the wide range of chemicals. 
And since they have a secondary filter that's the same type as the primary filter, they can detect breakthrough while still maintaining safety. So once you have filter breakthrough, a filter change still needs to happen. However, the application doesn't need to stop immediately since it's still being filtered. It has a brand new filter that's on top of the sensor. So these hoods can also communicate their status via a software package accessory, and they can integrate into applications successfully. These hoods also have places where services can be piped into the corner posts, and the filters are larger, so the maintenance can actually be spread out further. The box on the front that you see in the photo has a built-in computer that tracks the user, sash position, filter life, alarm history, and it's able to be seen by, let's say you're in a university lab, the instructor is able to go back and look at all of that data. So for any manufacturer of carbon filtered enclosures to protect you and the manufacturer, the first step will always be to fill out a chemical assessment form. So this ensures your application is appropriate for the fume hood. And it also is going to help the manufacturer determine what hood type to choose out of the three different definitions. Also, with this information, we can estimate the filter life for your application. So if you're interested in a carbon filtered enclosure, be prepared to fill one of these out. It will ask for things like the type of handling, your chemical names, type of container, whether it's open or closed, uh, the dilution percentage, the temperature, handling frequency, quantity, and duration of use. So basically, the more detail you put into the chemical assessment form, the more accurate we can be on the expected filter life. So some people call in and ask me, which is better, ducted or ductless? So I always have to tell them, in the fume hood world, there is nothing that is black and white, and it's not as easy as that, unfortunately. So it's really about weighing the pros and cons. The one large consideration that often gets overlooked is the maintenance part of having a ductless hood. So I always try and be as transparent as possible to show what's involved in owning one of these hoods, since most people that have ducted hoods do not have to deal with much maintenance except for you know, servicing the blower or BAV system every once in a while. So otherwise, the ducted hoods are mostly set it and forget it. The filters will need to be changed on a ductless hood regardless of what type you have. And some sensors will need to be replaced depending on what type of hood you have on a regular basis. Also, user training becomes even more important because the user has to know what to do in the event of alarm. Um, because on these hoods, there are usually more alarms than just the low airflow that you would see normally on a ducted hood. So keeping all personnel trained is key with the ductless enclosures. So here are some photos of what happens behind the header panels on different LabCon code ductless fume hoods. The one on the left is the DH3 or filtered fume hood, and the one on the right is the DH2, the paramount. So they both have stacked components, so you need to make sure you have full access to the top of the fume hood if you're considering a ductless fume hood. Also, since the air comes back into the room, it's important to have an air gap on top of the filters so the air can recirculate back into the room. So for this reason, ceiling enclosures or the metal shrouds that go around ductwork are strongly discouraged on these hoods since a lot of times that air gets put into the ceiling grid. And you might think, you know, why do you even need a ceiling enclosure on a ductless hood because there isn't any duct to cover up? Well, some people just still really like the appearance of it, but in this situation, we're going to take the safety in the fume hood effectiveness over appearance. So because going back to that room pressurization conversation, if you're taking air from the room and putting it into a different space without having makeup air, you're going to create a negative pressure, and you're going to throw off that balance in the room, and it will affect your fume hood containment. So we already discussed the maintenance conversation, because a typical ducted hood has minimal maintenance after it's installed. The infrastructure and remote blower may take some extra effort, but once they're set, you won't need to think about them for a while. 
So with a ductless hood, the maintenance schedule needs to be planned out because it's up to the facility to make arrangements for filter changes and disposal, as well as recommissioning the hoods after the filter changes. So with a ducted hood, the user can be a little more lenient with the chemicals used. You don't have to worry about filling up filters or not being able to use certain chemicals at all. And in most cases with a ducted hood, the worst that can happen is your fume hood liner will corrode and you'll have to replace it. You wouldn't have to worry about your filter having breakthrough and possibly stopping the work before it's complete. As long as your blower is going on a ducted hood, the fume hood is pretty much going to work. Also, a ducted hood can assist with your minimum laboratory exhaust requirements. Um, there are minimum air changes for every space, even office spaces. Laboratories tend to have more air changes. So the fume hood can help with that. Uh, the ductless hood cannot. So um, the general building exhaust would need to be sized accordingly. But on the other side of the coin, the ducted hoods require infrastructure. And you have to account for the makeup air, the duct work, mounting blowers on your rooftop. So you add all those, um, and they all add up costs on a project. And in some cases, it might be really difficult to route duct work and mount a blower. So here are four things to consider when looking to make a decision on a ducted or a ductless fume hood. First, check to see if the application is even a good candidate. So you're going to fill out your chemical assessment form, and then you're going to let the manufacturer analyze your application. So things that will fill up the filters quickly, such as forced evaporation, would not be a good fit. And we'll go into some more detail about um, some good and bad fits here in a little bit. The chemical assessment form will also tell the manufacturer if the chemicals you are using will be effectively filtered. Basically, we will be able to look up the chemicals you're using and see if they have a good affinity to carbon. And if they don't, it will not be a good fit. And then you can look at the cost of the filter replacement to come up with your expected maintenance costs and weigh the pros and cons to see if that's the direction you want to go in. So here's another quick reference pros and cons list on the ductless fume hoods to summarize what I've been talking about. So the great things are that they're portable and flexible and they don't impose a drain on your HVAC system since they don't exhaust air out, but they do require maintenance. And you do have to be mindful of what applications can be done in that hood. And those applications are the ones that have to be cleared with the manufacturer. So extra training needs to be done to make sure the users are aware of how to, be, how to use the equipment and be mindful of what alarms may happen. So I'm just going to touch really quickly on testing, since the ductless hoods are a little different. The sulfur hexafluoride tracer gas that's used in the standard ASHRAE test will actually go straight through the carbon filters. So in LabConco's test lab, we hooked up a canopy to the hood to capture the vapors, and we actually performed a standard ASHRAE 110 test. We also performed a modified ASHRAE test that's the one that can be done in the field, and it's basically putting some isopropyl alcohol in a um, in a metal tray in the fume hood, and then using putting the mannequin in front of the hood just like normal and using a PID detector to see to basically um, see if it detects any of that IPA that's in the metal tray. So the setup is the same. The mannequin's in front of the hood. The tracer is just different, and um, it's allowed to evaporate in the hood. So when you're weighing the pros and the cons of costs on a project going from ducted to ductless, for the ducted, take into account all of the infrastructure that does, that does not need to be purchased, as well as the annual energy costs. And for the ductless, take into account the filters and any sensors that need to be purchased. On the example from before, the actual annual energy cost for the LabConco hood would be about $113,400. So that's how much, if the hoods were operating half the year, that's how much the hoods would actually cost to operate. The ductless hoods would be $0 compared to that. But on that same size job, the startup filter costs would be about $360,000. 
since there were 45 hoods and they were six foot fume hoods. So there isn't always a clear cut answer of which way to go. And ultimately, the choice is going to be a factor of many different variables. And it actually might turn out that a mixture of both ducted and ductless is where you ultimately end up. So to make your decision even easier, here are some more applications where you would absolutely want to go ducted. So anytime you have a specialty application, such as acid digestion with forced evaporation or perchloric acid use, those hoods require a washdown system and a dedicated exhaust blower, so you cannot go with ductless. Also, anytime you have a classified hazardous location and the hood needs to be explosion proof or void of spark potential, those are one and the same, the fans are in the airstream in a ductless hood and there are electronic components that are not EP rated. Um, so that would take the ductless hood out of contention. Or if you just simply don't want the maintenance burden. So other applications where you would want to go with ducted are your highly exothermic reaction, so something that might cause a lot of smoke, something like that, or using mercury, insecticides, or hydrogen cyanide. Another important thing I will mention is sometimes when I get calls where people say, you know, oh, I'm not working with anything too terrible, so it shouldn't be a problem, because people try and get out of filling out that chemical assessment form, but there are four chemicals that are really not a good fit um, if you're using it in any kind of volume. So those are acetone, ethanol, methanol, and acetonitrile. So once again, those are acetone, ethanol, methanol, and acetonitrile. They are chemicals that people typically do not see as very harsh. So if you use any of those four chemicals on a regular basis, then it would not be a good fit since the filter capacity is very low for those chemicals. So something like a cleaning procedure involving acetone would definitely want to go ducted. So to sum it all up, ducted hoods can pretty much take all applications. You may just need to modify the liner material or mechanical system for a specific application. Ductless hoods, so DH1 and DH2 hoods, use chemical family specific activated carbon filters. And filtered fume hoods, or the DH3 hoods, have one comprehensive filter type to use on acids, bases, and solvents. They also have the secondary filter after the sensor to ensure safety after breakthrough. And you will absolutely want to go ducted with the specialty hood applications or forced evaporations and anything with the four low molecular weight solvents I mentioned before. So everyone, we have reached the end. Uh, and I hope you've enjoyed this webinar. I have certainly enjoyed sharing my time with you today. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to send those in. I just want to say thanks again for spending your valuable time with me today. I hope you're able to take some of this new knowledge and apply it to your lab. Um, and have a great rest of your day and stick around if you'd like to listen to some Q&A. Thanks so much. Thank you, Beth, for that informative presentation. It's time for Q&A, and if you have a question you'd like to ask Beth Mankemeyer, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, What type of ductwork should I use with my fume hood? Um, that's a good question. So a lot of times uh, people, people ask me this question. Um, and basically, you want to make sure that your duct material is going to meet any kind of local fire codes and also be compatible with the chemicals that you're working with. So if it meets those kind of those two criteria, then it would be a good fit. There isn't uh, necessarily like a black and white answer for what duct material to to use. Is stainless steel a good material to use for the fume hood liner as a general rule? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So a lot of people call in and they ask 
is they, people think that stainless steel is kind of this comprehensive material that would be used in fume hoods. And um, the truth is people actually then call in if they have chemicals that they're using that aren't compatible. So any kind of mineral acids, something that would corrode the stainless steel, that would not be a good idea. So the same question kind of applies to the ductwork question, where if you're using something like a mineral acid that would, um, that would corrode the stainless steel, that would not be a good idea. And obviously when you're getting into specialty applications, um, you'll have to look, because there are things like stainless steel perchloric acid fume hoods, if you were using something other than perchloric acid that would affect that stainless steel, then it would not be a good idea. So typically for general chemistry fume hoods, what you're going to see is fiberglass line because fiberglass has a very wide range of chemical resistance. Um, for example, I mean, all of Lab Conco's fume hoods, the general chemistry fume hoods are lined in, uh, in some type of fiberglass liner. And we do see that with our competitors as well, that they, they offer um, a material called FRP. We, that's what we have too for our XL and Extreme. So FRP is fiberglass. Uh, reinforced polyester. So if you're looking for general chemistry, I would recommend the, the fiberglass. Which hood would you recommend for carcinogens? So that kind of depends because if it, it might not be a fume hood that you're necessarily looking for. It might be something like a biosafety cabinet. So. I would probably have to um, look at that application a little bit better because you have to think with a fume hood, you're just taking whatever's in the hood and you're putting it outside. So with carcinogens, uh, it, it depends on what you're working with, to be honest, um, and if you need some kind of a filter in that system. So typically, I guess you would go ducted or if you needed something specific that, um, where you would have to have it filtered out. I guess I would just have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. If I'm using flammable chemicals, do I need an explosion-proof fume hood? Um, so my blanket answer to that is typically no. So you're, just because you're using flammable chemicals does not mean you need an explosion-proof fume hood. When we're talking about explosion-proof fume hoods, we look at removing the source of a spark in the, um, on the actual fume hood. And it actually refers to the exterior more than the interior because the interior doesn't have any electrical components. So if you are putting the fume hood in a room that has a high concentration of flammable vapors or chemicals, that is when you need an explosion-proof fume hood. So if it is um, classify, if it's going into a room that's classified as a hazardous location, then that is when you need an explosion-proof fume hood. There's a lot of misconception about explosion-proof. Um, so if you're just working with flammable chemicals, a standard fume hood would be fine because you're going to dilute the interior of your fume hood with room air. So typically it is just fine to go with a standard fume hood. Well, I would like to once again thank Beth Mankemeyer for her presentation. Do you have any final comments? Uh, no, I just want to thank everyone for spending their time with me today. Um, I really appreciate it, and I hope everyone learned something new. Well, thank you once again. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Lab Conco, for making today's educational webcast possible. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through April 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.